Uh, okay, thank you. Thanks for finding your way here. Is that, a, yeah, don't do that to me. <laughs> we are uh, coming this morning, as you know, to chapter three. No, chapter four, quattro. Wow, we're just uh, moving along here. This is uh, one of my favorite stories, and I'm getting tired of hearing myself say that. I think uh, every week I'm going to be telling you this is one of my favorite stories. Uh, but this really is. This is the story that we have from John of the woman at the well. And if there was ever a story that should encourage us in so many different ways, it has to be this one. Uh, John has quite intentionally put the story of Jesus' conversation with a woman at a well, an unnamed woman, by the way, a Samaritan, right up back to back with a conversation with a character that we know his name, Nicodemus. And if you were to put these two human beings in the same room and look at them, you would think the differences could not be any more dramatic. They have nothing in common. Nicodemus, wealthy, respected, well-educated, articulate, an impressive man by virtually every measure we could apply to him, and a woman, I tell you candidly, that it would be easy to just not even see her. Just someone who has reached a point where it seems that she has wasted her life and reached a point where there's just not much left there. And we would think to ourselves, wow, these two people live in two different universes. And yet we learn as we look at this story that the one thing which unites them is the one thing that's the most important of all. And that this one thing in which they were in a common situation transcends infinitely anything we might have applied as a measure that would distinguish them. Because they all need God's transforming work. Both of them need it, we all need it. And at that point, of course, we're talking about something of, no matter what our situation in life is, we're broke. We are flat broke. This is only something that God can do. The difference between the story is more of a difference between cause and effect. When Jesus talks to Nicodemus, he tells him, you must be born again, and that only the Spirit can do that. The cause is the Spirit. You can't manipulate it. You cannot make it happen. With the woman, it's the same story, but it's the effect of being born once again. And this effect is going to be that she becomes a well of water to those she meet. God places his spirit within her, and that bubbling, wonderful expression of living water becomes the defining quality of her life from that point on. So it's the same theme. It's looked at from two different angles here. And that's what we have before us this morning. I'm going to mention to you what was just mentioned in the earlier service. We don't meet for the next six weeks. You know that, don't you? So this is our last uh, time together. Uh, and uh, we'll be back together. I believe the date is the 15th of January. So I will miss you uh, with great uh, uh, pain and um, uh, affection, but nevertheless, uh, we'll take that break during the holiday season. Anyway, we're going to cover this. This is quite a bit to cover. Whoops, let me see if... There we are. Uh, 26 verses, which is more than I usually try to uh, cover, but this is one intact story. There's no other way to do it, so I'm going to move pretty rapidly, hopefully not breathlessly, and uh, I think I can get this all in within, a, oh, say, four hours or so. So we should be in good shape, you know. So uh, anyway, and I'm going to try to move as, as quickly as I can and uh, touch the high points. You're all familiar with this story. You've read it many times, so I don't feel like I need to go through it in detail. But there are certain points where certainly we want to uh, focus in. So I'm not going to read the whole thing at once. We'll take it a bite at a time, one paragraph at a time. And the first of these paragraphs... Uh, begins verse 1, uh, chapter 4, Gospel of John, Word of God. Now when Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard Jesus is making and baptizing more disciples than John, although it was not Jesus himself, but his disciples who baptized, he left Judea and started back to Galilee. But he had to go through Samaria. So he came to a Samaritan city called Sychar, 
near the plot of ground that Jacob had given to his son, Joseph. Jacob's well was there. And Jesus, tired out by his journey, was sitting by the well. It was about 6 p.m. using Roman time. There's a debate here. People write PhDs about this. It doesn't really matter. But I'm just mentioning to you, if John is using Jewish time, it was about noon, and your Bible translation may put it that way, Roman time, 6 p.m. That's all I'm going to say about that, just so you know. There's a little variation on that. But otherwise, uh, we'll take a look at this. Let's have a word of prayer, and we'll get started. Our Father, we are deeply grateful that Jesus had time for an impressive man from Jerusalem named Nicodemus, and he had just as much time and just as much interest in a nameless woman who came to a well in Samaria. We are grateful that we serve such a Savior. And we're grateful that not only did he have time for both of them, but he has time for us. And we pray that the Lord Jesus Christ would be present with us now so that the truths that we have before us in this story would be brought home to us in a way that will be of deep encouragement. And we ask all of that in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, well, um, this little introductory comment is supposed to tie it to the material that we looked at last week. You remember that the brass, the uh, Jewish people who were in the leadership role, were trying to get John the Baptist and Jesus to become conflicted with each other, and that's kind of their divide and conquer uh, mentality, and of course that's kind of where we left things. And now Jesus is aware of that. He knows that's going on. He also knows that there is this little kind of note of envy or animosity that might developing. Jesus is now baptizing more people, becoming more popular, you might say. And so <clears throat> basically Jesus wants to leave this behind. Not because he's afraid of the conflict. He will become highly engaged in conflict, of course, soon enough. He'll come back to Jerusalem. He'll set his face as a flint to go to Jerusalem. It's not that he's avoiding that or fearful of it, but it's too soon. And so rather than having this firestorm break out this point, he's going to go ahead and exit the situation. The story we have before us, which comes here, as I, I assume you know, is unique to John. So uh, John tells us something that nobody else mentions, but is this uh, interesting encounter with a woman there. It's reported with such detail and really such sensitivity that many commentators would say you could only be a reporter at this level if you were an eyewitness of it. And I tend to agree. I know that the disciples went into town to get some food. It doesn't say all of them went. And I wonder if maybe John or a couple of others were there a discreet distance as this conversation took place and he's actually able to report what he himself uh, was able to uh, see at that point. We'll leave that for speculation, but it's possible. Jesus himself did not baptize, uh, we learn here, but his disciples did so. Phil asked a great question last week. Uh, was the baptism of these two, John the Baptist and Jesus, basically the same or different? And I gave what I think is the correct answer that is fundamentally the same baptism. Uh, certainly we would uh, tie some kind of greater weight maybe to the baptism of Jesus, and yet notice Jesus himself baptizes through his disciples. Calvin says part of the reason he does that is to make sure that nobody gets a sense that they had some special baptism, and also to assure us that when we come to church and are baptized by an agent of Jesus, that is a legitimate expression of Jesus' own work among us. Just as when we hold the, the uh, bread and the wine in our hands, we're supposed to understand, kind of like the guys that were on the road to Emmaus, Jesus handed them the bread and disappeared out of their sight. And that's how we should view that bread. It's just as if Jesus had just handed that to us. He's gone, but there it is. That is his presence with us reflected in that bread. That, that sense of immediate presence of Christ is intended. And something of that is probably implied here. So anyway, Jesus left Judea, starting back to Galilee, knowing the malice of these leaders, of course, not wanting to uh, hang around and let that become more problematic than it already was. 
The Greek word for uh, Jesus leaving is the word afeken, a little bit of an unusual word. It actually can mean to forgive or to leave off a burden, something like that, but it, it can also mean to abandon. And that's probably the sense here. Jesus abandoned Jerusalem. Now, the reason for that use of that word, not just leaving, there's other words that would have suggested just exiting the situation, but abandoning Jerusalem is connected to what we saw earlier. Jesus came to Jerusalem. He cleansed the temple. He proved beyond anybody's reasonable doubt that he had the authority to do so. Nicodemus himself said, we know you're a teacher come from God. Nobody could do this stuff unless God was with him. This was a known fact. So Jesus is acting with the requisite authority to do what he's doing, and they didn't repent. It was an opportunity to repent, and they declined the offer. Now, a few did, Nicodemus, presumably, some others. But as a whole, the, the religious leaders entrenched themselves against this one who, by all practical measures, was certainly acting within his rights, to do what he was doing. And at that point, they were committing themselves to a direction from which there would be no easy retreat. So Jesus gave them the opportunity. They declined it. He's abandoning them now. He'll come back later, not to offer repentance, but to pronounce judgment. Your house is left to you desolate. First time through, this is my father's house. You've turned it into a marketplace. Second time around, You've turned this into a den of thieves. Your house, not my father's house anymore, your house is desolate. It's over. Judgment. Not one stone left upon another. Kingdom is taken from you, given to others. You see, that's the difference between those two incidents. So he abandons Jerusalem and goes off um, to a place of relative obscurity. Jesus, of course, uh, could stay in Jerusalem, the center of the universe from their point of view, but no, he goes off to a very obscure place, a place that was uh, held kind of in an uh, arm's length view from the people that lived in Jerusalem. These were sort of like hicks. That would be the view of those Galileans. It was viewed as kind of a troublesome area, and uh, something of that was in the kind of culture of the day, but that's where Jesus goes to carry on his ministry, and he had to go through Samaria. Interesting way that John puts it. He had to, he insisted on going through Samaria. You can always, you can almost sense the backstory. Okay, Jesus, we're going to Galilee, so let's head east, go to the fords of the Jordan, cross over so we can head up the east side of the Jordan and come back to, no, no, guys, we're going through Samaria. Uh, come again, no, Samaria. Because nobody did that. No self-respecting Jew, unless it was an absolute emergency, would go through Samaria. It just wasn't done. And Jesus is insistent. He has a, an appointment, you see, that he has to keep there, uh, there in Samaria. So he had to go. Unusual travel plans. Uh, but it is the first indication in John's Gospel of something that becomes extremely important uh, throughout all the Gospels, and really, uh, Betsy alluded to it this morning in the sermon, uh, that Jesus is not simply the, the Messiah for the Jewish nation, but for the Gentiles, you see, for the outsiders, including the Samaritans. And so at this point, already, Jesus gives a signal that the message he's bringing, the ministry he has, is going to reach way beyond the borders of Israel. And now the first evidence of that takes place as we find ourselves with him in Samaria. So he came to a Samaritan city called Sychar, near the plot of ground that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. That, by the way, is not in the Old Testament, but it was a well-established Jewish tradition, which John simply takes for granted here. So it's a, uh, a known location uh, in that day. Uh, it was an obscure little village. Uh, some have thought maybe it was the same as a place called Shechem, but they are two distinct places. Shechem is well known in the Old Testament. If you know your Old Testament, you know there's a variety of stories that orbit around Shechem. Uh, this is a little town that was some distance from it. Uh, Shechem was the area where Joseph, the son of Jacob, had been buried. Uh, it may, this city Sychar, which is uh, maybe a few miles distant, uh, may be the same as a community there called Iskar. 
Uh, some people think that is the same community. It probably is. It may have been rebuilt later. We don't know if there has been a continuous population there over the centuries, but nevertheless, there is a city that kind of meets the bill. So that may be the location. John tells us Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired out by his journey, was sitting by the well, assuming it was about 6 p.m., sometime in the early evening. Uh, he was tired. <clears throat> John, of course, is most famous in terms of his Christology for emphasizing the deity of Christ. Right off the bat, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God, you know, and from that point on, we keep coming back, he beats that drum. You can't honestly read the Gospel of John without becoming a pretty thoroughgoing Trinitarian, because he just comes back to that again and again. But he's not unaware of the humanity of Christ. In fact, we see little hints of that, enough to know that John wants us to keep a balanced view. Jesus was weary. He was actually weary. Not just pretending, he was there, been a long trip, walking all day, heat and so on. He sat down, felt good to sit down by this well. Uh, Jesus is God among us. But the New Testament is quite emphatic that while he was here in his incarnate situation, he lived as a man. He was in a man-sized container and limited himself to the experience of being a human being. So though he never ceased to be God, we have this as classic Christian theology, in his incarnation he nevertheless lived as a man and therefore wasn't constantly pulling his deity out of his back pocket at various convenient times. When he healed, he was doing so in the same way that others in the biblical narrative have healed. When he had supernatural knowledge, he was relying on the same kind of supernatural knowledge that came sometimes to prophets in the Old Testament. The point is he wasn't, he wasn't falling back on his deity in those moments when he seemed supernatural. Even though it was supernatural power at work, it was working through true humanity. And so as a man, he goes through the experiences of humanity, and this is just one of many examples that we see, of course, through the gospel narrative. Um, 6 p.m., I told you about assuming Roman time. It brings us to the next uh, little paragraph. A Samaritan woman came to draw water. And Jesus said to her, uh, would you mind giving me a drink? His disciples had gone into the city to buy some food. The Samaritan woman said to him, whoa, 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 whoa the phone. How is it that you, a Jewish man, Ask a drink of me, a woman of Samaria. You see, Jews don't share things in common with Samaritans. Jesus said to her, you know, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that's saying to you, please give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. So a Samaritan woman came to draw water. The very opposite, as we were saying earlier, of Nicodemus. Nicodemus, we know his name. This is an unnamed woman, one of the most famous human beings in the history of the world, the woman at the well. How many millions, probably billions of people know the story of the woman at the well and we don't even know her name, you know? She comes, she's a woman, that's strike two. In the ancient world, all due respects, to all the women in the room, at that time, you weren't faring so well, even in the Jewish world. Second class citizen, you know, that whole deal, we don't need to explore it, but you know it. But to make matters worse, a Samaritan woman, unnamed. The Samaritans, of course, were held in a kind of disdain by self-respecting Jewish people. She's poor. She has to get her own water. She doesn't have servants to go out there and do that kind of thing for her. In every possible way, she represents someone who is the visible opposite of Nicodemus. As I said earlier, however, both of them shared a common need, and the need they had far outweighed any difference that might otherwise distinguish them. They had a need of new birth, as do we all. And it was something only God can do. We can't do it ourselves. 
Nicodemus is advised of the only cause of new birth, the spirit, sovereign, blowing like the wind. The woman is told of the effect of new birth, a well of water springing up in you to everlasting life. Jesus, God of the universe there, starts a conversation at the most simple level. Isn't that great? Just, just such a simple, now it was an extraordinary request uh, from her point of view, but it's just, could I have a drink of water? You know, uh, No bands are playing, no angels are singing, it's just as uh, natural as we could possibly imagine. Uh, ask him a favor to confer a blessing. I'm going to drop in a little Sunday school lesson in advance here. Sometimes Jesus will ask a favor of you. Now, he usually doesn't do it audibly, you know. Sometimes it'll come kind of unexpectedly, and it'll usually seem like an inconvenience. But even these little moments when Jesus asks a favor of you, and it may appear to be an inconvenience, be sure to say yes, because what he wants to do is bless you. And sometimes to bless you, he has to get you out of your rhythm a little bit, you know, just like he did with this woman. So he's asking a simple favor, intending in that moment to give her the most extraordinary experience she's ever had in her life, period. Just based on a little request for a cup of water. The disciples had gone into the city to buy some food. Food's plural here. Uh, they were permitted under Jewish law to buy food from Samaritans. That didn't violate any rules. The food that was going to be purchased would, I'm sure, meet the rules of kosher. And so uh, he's there by himself. Jesus is maybe with John, maybe one or two other disciples kind of off at a distance. <clears throat> well, the Samaritan woman is, to say the least, shocked. Um, how is it that you, a Jewish man, Ask a drink of me, a woman of Samaria, and then John gives that little parenthetical remark. She knows he's Jewish. She doesn't know he's deity. She doesn't know anything, but she can surmise, triangulate just by what she sees there, that this man is a Jewish man. She can tell that, probably based on his accent, probably based on his dress on the fact that he's weary from travel. So by ordinary appearances, he looks like just an ordinary guy, a Jewish man traveling for some reason through Samaria. Uh, when she asks the question, John puts this subtly in Greek such that both the word woman and Samaritan are emphasized. It's the word order that tells us that. So how do you ask a drink of me, a woman, of Samaria, you know, I mean, that's kind of the flavor of it. Like this is a sort of really putting her in a state of some astonishment here. Uh, the hostility towards Samaria, you know, dates back to the Assyrian deportation, 72, uh, 722 BC, Sargon II is the Assyrian king. He bumped off his predecessor. It's a great story. It has nothing to do with our present uh, concern. But from that point on, that region had been populated by people who were uh, racially mixed, for one thing, but more importantly, religiously mixed, because the Assyrians brought in other Gentiles. They intermarried and became this kind of a hybrid religion there, a lot of superstition, a lot of strange beliefs that were kind of mixed into a sort of quasi-monotheism. From the Jewish point of view, it was really almost despicable what was happening there in Samaria. They were very dismissive of it, and of course Samaritans themselves had a negative reputation largely from that. A little bit more of a technical point that may have, be of interest, the parenthetical remark. Jews do not share things in common with Samaritans. That statement was true on its face prior to 70 AD. It was no longer true on its face after 70 AD because there was no longer a, a Jewish world in Jerusalem, nor was there much of a Samaria left. Samaria had been virtually destroyed by Vespasian and his attack on Jerusalem. He came down through that region. Of course, Jerusalem was destroyed and the Jewish population was deposed, or, uh, deported or killed. And so to say Jews have no dealings with Samaritans became basically untrue after 70 AD. And it's one of those little arguments subtle in John's gospel that has caused some scholars to believe that John's gospel was written before 70 AD. 
There's other little hints in that direction, and I'll mention them as we go along. Most believe that John was written later, maybe a couple of decades later. I'm not going to die on this hill, but I'm just mentioning to you, it is an interesting technical point. And some very heavyweight scholars have weighed in on the side of an earlier date for John and with that of all the Old Testament, saying all of it was written before 70 AD. It's a very interesting, somewhat intriguing question, totally beside the point, but I mention it because you're all scholars and you take an interest in these things, don't you? So there you are. Jesus answered and said, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that's saying to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. If you knew the gift, the word Dorian is the word that's used here for a gift. We get the name Dorothy from that. Uh, it implies a gift for which there is no possible quid pro quo, a true gift. You know, we're in the Christmas season. All of us are going to be involved in gift exchanges, aren't we? A gift exchange is not a gift, friends. It's a swap. Now, I like them. I don't mind it a bit. I like to give gifts, and I like to receive gifts. You know, it's just the way it is. But there is a difference between that and a true gift, and we all know that, don't we? And the sense of the word here, especially as it's used by John, is that this is a gift for which there is not, nor could there be, any exchange. What are you going to give back in this situation? This is a pure gift, you see. If you knew the gift of God. Nothing offered back, no payment, no preliminary works, no accreditation, you know, something like that to warrant it. No, no, no. If you knew the gift of a sovereign God given through his spirit, without conditions, without repayment, you would have asked him. And notice again what's absent. Not pleading, not cajoling, not all kinds of things that represent some sort of preliminary attempt, you know, to build up some little credit along the way, just asking. It's a little bit of sola fide once again showing up here. You would have asked, and as a result of that, he would have given you living water. The idea of living water is not unknown. When we were talking about Nicodemus, you remember Jesus said to Nicodemus, are you the teacher of Israel and you don't know about the new birth, you know? And some people get a little upset with Jesus thinking that's kind of unfair because where do we read about the new birth in the Old Testament? I tried to argue, well, the idea is there, even if the phrase isn't. Well, in this case, it's even more clear. Uh, the Old Testament, I don't know how much this woman had been exposed to the Old Testament. Technically, the Samaritans only accepted the first five books. But the idea of living water is really pretty common in the Old Testament. It shows up on more than one occasion. Pointing in that direction, Isaiah 44, I'll pour water on him who is thirsty, floods on the dry ground, I'll pour my spirit on your descendants. Zechariah chapter 14, an amazing chapter that really describes in poetic imagery the impact of, of the ministry of Messiah in Jerusalem when Messiah would come. In that chapter, Zechariah says, in that day it shall be that living waters will flow from Jerusalem, half of them toward the Eastern Sea, half of them toward the Western Sea, both in summer and in winter it shall occur. This is not a description of topography, it's a description of poetry, in poetry, of the effect of Messiah, in which living water would be flowing out of Jerusalem to the world, which indeed is exactly what we would say happened. For my people, writes Jeremiah, have committed two evils, they've forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and hewn for themselves cisterns. The most dramatic example of this is chapter 47, of the prophet Ezekiel. And so I'll give you that as homework uh, if you want to take a look at it later. The last several chapters of Ezekiel have the prophet describing a temple. And at the beginning, it sounds like he's describing an actual structure, you know, like architectural detail. Uh, but the more you read, the more you realize this, this description of a temple morphs into something that could never really be a concrete and mortar uh, structure in this world. 
And we really see that most clearly by chapter 47, where Ezekiel says, out from under this temple is flowing a great river on all, point, all, all points of the compass, flowing out. It's an architect's nightmare by that time, you know, to try to envision this structure in which a river is flowing out to the world, and the further you get down that river, the more water there is. It's a growing, expanding river, which of course is simply a way of explaining in prophetic imagery that out of Jerusalem, out of the new temple that is created in the kingdom established by Christ, we have a river of living water, if you will, flowing to the world, and the entire world is going to be the recipient of that great blessing until the knowledge of God covers the earth as the waters cover the world, you know, that idea. And so we have this notion living water certainly repeated more than once in the Old Testament. Uh, the notion of a springing well suggests something that can't run dry. It's a spring is a, a never-ending source of uh, water. As I was reflecting on this, it reminded me, I don't know, it surprised me this came back to me, but I remembered when I was a sophomore in high school, that's a long time ago, by the way, I was in a biology class taught by a teacher I loved very much. His name was Mr. Behrens, of course now deceased, and, uh, but I was there in my sophomore class, and uh, he, was, he was a great teacher teaching biology, and we were taking basic biology. And uh, in this class, he was beginning to talk about the importance of water in connection with life. And a girl in the back of the class, sitting about two rows from where I was, raised her hand and asked the question quite soberly, quite seriously, uh, Mr. Behrens, is water alive? That was her question. She was quite sincere. You know. There was a little snicker that kind of, you, you could hear it across the, the class, you know. <laughs> I'm afraid I was one of the snickerers. And I hate to tell you that. Is water alive? Come on, you know. But she was sincere, and Mr. Behrens, to his credit, seized on that, vindicated her, and gave us a little bit of a rebuke for laughing at that question and said, you know, in the ancient world, people believed water was alive. They had the principle of hylozoism. Water seems to move on its own. It seemed to have a life principle in it. And certainly all the ancients noticed that wherever water goes, life shows up. You could have a river running through the wilderness and it's dry and barren except where that river is and there it's flourishing with living things. Wouldn't you think that water is alive? And we all properly rebuked, we're agreeing. Yes, Mr. Barrett, you're quite correct. That's a good, very good question she was asking. <laughs> you know, but anyway, this is the idea. The ancient people did have some notion that water was a living thing. And, and so when Jesus says to her, I'm going to give you living water, she may still have been thinking about the water in that well, you see. She may have not quite crossed the line yet to realize what he was describing, but... We can kind of understand why she would think that, but it begins to at least be clear that something else is going on. So the next paragraph, the woman said to him, Sir, you don't have a bucket. The well's deep. Uh, where exactly are you going to get that living water? Maybe even looking down in that well, you know. And then a little bit testy, uh, do you think you're greater than our father Jacob? You see, these Samaritans, they had a little bit of a complex. They knew they were despised. And yet they were proud of their heritage. They thought they had some things to boast about. They traced their lineage back to Jacob and his son Joseph especially. And so that is kind of where this question is coming from. Are you, do you think you're greater than our father Jacob, who gave us this well with his sons and his flocks drank from it? Jesus said to her, well, you know, whoever drinks of this water, pointing to the well, is going to be thirsty again. But those who drink of the water that I will give them will never be thirsty. The water that I will give will become in them a spring of water gushing up to everlasting life. And the woman said, Sir, give me this water so that I may never be thirsty or have to come to this well again. It ain't a pretty question, 
Doesn't quite show that she gets it, but she knows something is going on here. And the question at least opens the door for Jesus' uh, ensuing conversation. Well, she said, you know, originally, uh, how are you going to get the water out of this well? It's a little bit of humor in it, really, you might say. Uh, you don't have a bucket, the well is deep. Uh, if the correct well has been discovered, which some people believe it has, it was about 105 feet deep, so that's deep enough. Uh, where is this water? And she emphasizes subtly this living, this water, the living water that you referred to. Where's that going to come from? Uh, the question itself just implies that she's beginning to see something else is going on, doesn't quite know how to frame it, but she makes that statement. But then she also gets a little bit kind of put off. This is this Jewish man, and now he's making an extravagant offer to her, doesn't know what to make of it, but she still is going to defend, you know, the angels here a little bit, the Samaritan view of things. Uh, do you really think you're greater than our father Jacob, who gave us this well, you know? Uh, emphasis on the word you. Do you think you're greater than Jacob? Jesus doesn't answer that question. If he had answered it question, you know, straight up, he would have said, well, yes, as a matter of fact, I do believe I'm greater than Jacob, but he doesn't do that yet. That's not exactly the purpose of the present conversation. Uh, the Samaritans claim, claimed a descent from Joseph, the son of Jacob. They were proud of that heritage. Uh, there was a tradition I mentioned earlier. It was not in the Old Testament. You don't find it there, but you do find it in, in some fairly well-established Jewish tradition that uh, uh, Jacob had given his son that well, and that became part of the uh, pride of the people that lived in that area. Uh, Jesus says, everyone who drinks of this water is going to be thirsty again. He's probably pointing to that well. Ignoring the question about Jacob, are you greater than Jacob? He doesn't even go there. But highlighting the real issue, uh, which comes up here, those who drink of the water that I give will never be thirsty. Drink of that water, it'll satisfy your thirst temporarily. I'm offering you something that will satisfy a thirst in you, such that you'll never be thirsty again. The water that I will give will become in you its own spring of water, welling up to everlasting life. John, on multiple occasions, appeals to this sense of a thirst that lies within the human heart. We all know it. It expresses itself in a variety of ways, but it is that desire for satisfaction. And we often think this or that will give us this satisfaction. And certainly, certain possessions, certain achievements, this or that, can bring a certain degree of satisfaction, you know. Uh, not denying that, but we, even at that, we realize there's still something more we look at the behavior of people generally in the world and we can see that there is this almost passionate desire or a despair of getting satisfaction. And Jesus is kind of alluding to that now, that there is this desire that runs much more deeply in our psychology. Uh, so Jesus says, I'm going to give you something and if you will accept this from me, you will never, Greek there is ou me, it's two negatives, it covers the waterfront, usually translated never. You will never thirst because my water becomes a spring, kind of its own source, never ending. That was the remarkable thing about a spring, it doesn't ever run out of water. Uh, Jesus will repeat this promise on multiple occasions. In John chapter 6, the bread of life discourse, I'm the bread of life, he who comes to me will never hunger, he who believes in me will never thirst. Chapter 7, the Feast of Tabernacles is being celebrated there. On the last day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. It's a theme that recurs, this idea of a thirst. To be really thirsty is kind of a, an experience in our human uh, you know, drama that uh, can be very desperate at some times, to really need a drink. I remember once I was lost in Rome. This is literal. 
I was, I, was, I was a leader of a group, and I lost my group, and I lost myself, you know. And we had all agreed to meet at a certain restaurant, and I tell you, the restaurant was not where I thought it was supposed to be. And I walked into this shop, speaking extremely broken Italian, to a nice shopkeeper there who spoke no English, and I was trying to tell him I was looking for a restaurant. He didn't know where it was. And I was getting thirsty. I was parched, you know. And in, in Rome, you pay for the water. You don't just drink it. There's no drinking fountains. You pay by the bottle. <laughs> so anyway, he's looking at his internet, and he finally comes up with and gives me in Italian the, the, uh, the, the way to go. I was about five blocks away, you know. And so I found, I found the restaurant. I walked in. There were all my people, you know. My, my flock. <laughs> the shepherd was lost. The flock was found. And uh, I walked in there and sat down. They had a bottle of water there. And I tell you, I drank that and just... just have you ever been desperately thirsty? That's kind of the way I felt at that point. And it really does drive you. And the last promise in the Bible, listen to this, this is verse 17 of chapter 22 of the last book of the Bible says, come, let him who hears say come. If anyone thirsts, come. Whoever desires, let him take the water of life Freely. It's a beautiful image, isn't it? Shot through the scriptures, and really the first notice of it we have emphatically is a conversation with a woman at a well. Uh, Ezekiel's ever-expanding river there in chapter 47 is worth reviewing in that connection. Well, the woman said to him, Sir, please give me this water. There's been a little change now in her attitude. Uh, so that I may never be thirsty or have to come to this place again. No more arguing now, you know. Uh, a kind of a transition. The picture isn't quite right, or the question isn't quite right. It doesn't show quite the understanding we might hope for, but it's enough for Jesus to move forward, and he does with a bit of a bite. Uh, Jesus said to her, well, okay, uh, please go call your husband and come back before I give you this gift. The woman answered somewhat sheepishly, I suppose, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, well, yeah, you got that right. Uh, I have no husband. In fact, you've had five husbands, the one you have now, meaning the husband you have now is not your husband. That's implied. I'm not going to insist on that, but it does seem to be saying that she's now living with someone else's husband. So that would be the sense of that, probably. Uh, and so it, uh, you know, uh, is really picturing someone who's come to some fairly unhappy circumstances in life. Jesus says, what you've said is true. Well, <clears throat> in order for Jesus to give her this gift, we have to introduce something that's a little bit painful. Because the gospel is good news, and as all you uh, good Presbyterians know, before you can appreciate good news, you have to hear what? Bad news. Bad news. I used to teach Romans, as you know, at Whitworth, and I would always, my first lecture, I'd always tell people the book of Romans is divided into two great chunks. Uh, the first chunk, happily, is not as long as the last chunk, but still there, and I call it the bad news. And in it, Paul just drives home with relentless force what a hopeless, helpless, unhappy situation we are in. Without any possible way of redeeming ourselves, we are doomed, period. No matter who we are, whether we've seen a Bible or not, whether we've ever had any exposure to the Christian faith or not, regardless, we're doomed. Bad news. And when you really come to believe that, you see, and Paul, if, if you read Paul's argument thoughtfully, it becomes thunderingly clear that that's the state of the human heart, then good news comes as astonishing relief. But until we really appreciate our peril, we don't really appreciate the rescue <laughs> so much. And so, what does Jesus have to do? He has to give her a little bit of the law. The law is a condemning thing in this setting, and that's exactly what happens. So, it's going to pre, uh, produce repentance, uh, hopefully, but not immediately. Uh, 
she answers and says, well, I have no husband, and Jesus, of course, concurs with that. Her answer is truthful, a little dodgy, but truthful. Uh, but the question has pierced something of this conversation that seemed to be going along so well. Jesus probably has a little pregnant pause there, and then it confirms, yeah, you are telling me the truth in that score. Uh, you've had five husbands. The husband you now have is not your husband. So, true enough. Uh, her sorry life comes to light. Uh, we don't know the whole story here. Some people have thought, well, maybe she'd been widowed five times. Could be, I don't know. But the point is, the sense of the story is that she's kind of spiraled down so that now she's at a point where more or less despaired, you know, of any kind of virtuous life. Sometimes people just reach that point. I give up. You know, it's, it's over, it's over, what can I do? And you get that feeling with her. She's reached the point where she really doesn't have any moral defenses uh, to raise anymore. Uh, living with someone else's husband, uh, and uh, what do you do? Some families have a rule. At the dinner table, we don't talk about politics, and we don't talk about religion. And she brings up both, you see. This is the great uh, classic attempt to try to avoid the pain she's just felt by the request to call her husband. And so, I see you're a prophet. You know, can you just see this? Well, our fathers worshipped on this mountain, but you Jewish people say that we have to worship in Jerusalem. Well, Jesus doesn't entertain that for too long, but he does give a response. Woman, believe me, the hour is now coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain or in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship a God of whom you're ignorant. We, the Jewish people, worship a God who is known to us because salvation, the salvation tradition, comes out of the Jewish heritage. But... The hour is coming and now is when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father seeks such as these to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. <clears throat> Sir, I see you're a prophet. Um, you know, she could have repented right there. But no, this is her last stand. She's going to try to throw some theology into this and maybe avoid the the uh, uncomfortable uh, conversation that seems to be opening up before her. You're a prophet. True enough, not quite complete, but true as far as it goes. Uh, she knew by virtue of the fact that he's a prophet that her life is somewhat open and exposed before this one. Uh, she could have confessed, would have been a good time to do it, but instead she seizes on a theological debate, probably the most uh, the most conspicuous debate available to her as a Samaritan vis-a-vis -vis the Jews. So our fathers worshipped on this mountain, pointing to Mount Gerizim, which was visible from where they were having this conversation. You Jewish people say that Jerusalem is where people need to worship. Uh, the temple on Gerizim was built at a certain point in the history of the ancient northern tribes, as an attempt to give the people that lived there an option instead of going to Jerusalem. The rulers were fearful that the people would eventually get homesick for Jerusalem, they'd go back to Jerusalem, and the northern kingdom would be left in some degree of unhappy circumstances. And so they built their own alternative venues for worship, one of which was there on Mount Gerizim. And it functioned as a kind of alternative temple, along with several others for some years. However, in 168 BC, a guy by the name of Antiochus IV, who precipitated the Maccabean Revolt, turned that temple into a temple to Zeus. He was a Syrian Greek, and uh, so he's trying to insult all of Israel, including the northern tribes, and he transforms it into a pagan temple. That caused a fellow by the name of John Hyrcanus, who was a uh, ruler of the Jewish world a few years later, about 50 years later, to go and destroy that temple. So all that, were up, all that was there on Gerizim now were ruins, but you could still see them. And it was still, from the Samaritan point of view, viewed as a kind of holy precinct. And so those visible ruins were there, 
And uh, that's what she's using as a, uh, to pit you know, Jerusalem against their own holy place. We say we can worship here, you say it's gotta be in Jerusalem. Jesus gives this remarkable answer. Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when you worship the Father neither on this mountain or on Jerusalem. Interestingly here, Usually Jesus will say in advance of a weighty statement, amen, amen, you know, we see that otherwise in John. Here it says, he says, believe me. And I read one commentator who was speculating that might have been the point when in her heart was effected regeneration. Jesus commands her to believe me. And when Jesus gives a command like that, you might think, really, you know, the command is being obeyed, even though she may not have had any conscious awareness, God might have been changing her heart at that point. I kind of like the theory, I can't prove it to you, but one person suggested that. In any event, um, uh, she is um, uh, being told by Jesus here of a coming hour that's going to change everything an hour which is going to eliminate permanently and irrevocably this whole debate about where to worship. There are religions in the world today that still believe there are holy places to which you go. It's called a pilgrimage. The Old Testament had such a thing as a pilgrimage, a holy journey to a holy place. We don't have that as Christians. We don't believe there is a holy piece of real estate somewhere that we're supposed to go and God is especially present there. We don't accept that, you see, because we believe that the temple is a living, organic thing and that where two or three people are gathered, there Jesus is in the midst. We have a very different paradigm for what the temple looks like than those that still have physical structures. And that's what Jesus alludes to here. You know, the day is coming, in fact, it already is here, when the true worshipers are not clinging to a piece of real estate anymore. Uh, you worship, you Samaritans worship what you do not know. You plural, not you singular, you Samaritans worshiping a God you don't know. Uh, Paul will say to the Athenians sometime later, you have an altar to the unknown God. You're worshiping, fair enough, but you're worshiping into the abyss. You don't have any sense of what it is you're worshiping. We as Christians believe that that's true of every alternative religion in the world except the one that is squarely planted in the Word of God. It makes us sound arrogant, makes us sound proud, exclusive. It's not. It's really a great expression of humility. But nevertheless, we believe that people are very religious. We see that. It doesn't, not a function of you know, the sophistication of the society, everybody's religious. Even the atheist is deeply religious. You know, some of those religious people I've ever met were atheists, uh, sitting in God's lap to spit in his face and slap him at the same time. They were so angry at this God they didn't believe in, you know. But, uh, but nevertheless, we want to lovingly, graciously recognize the impulse to worship is built in by God's own creation of us. It's a light he's planted in us, but we need to get that light focused in the right direction, and that's why we go send missionaries around the world and so on. So you worship that which you do not know, uh, and uh, Jesus says uh, that the salvation is of the Jews. He means there, of course, that it was the Jewish nation, it was Abraham, it was his descendants that God specially chose and specially chose to entrust to them what Paul calls the oracles of God. Is there any advantage of being a Jew? Paul asks Romans chapter 3. Yes, in every respect, to them were entrusted the oracles of God. In chapter 9, theirs is the glory, theirs is the adoption, theirs is the, theirs is the worship, there is the very uh, <clears throat> ethnicity out of which Jesus himself came. So there is a distinct significance to the Jewish tradition. Doesn't mean they were all believers or anything like that, but it meant that that was certainly the distinctly correct tradition out of which a worship of the true God would originate. But Jesus even then says, the hour is coming and now is when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. The but there is emphatic, but the time is coming and now is when true worshipers will worship 
not in a way restricted geographically. And that, of course, is the most important feature of the New Covenant era, worshiping in spirit and truth. Commonly, spirit is taking the stand for the subjective side of your Christian experience. Assuming every one of us in this room is a Christian believer, you are very much aware that there is a subjective element. It's not just intellectual. There's something else very difficult to describe, impossible to deny. We know that God has done something that is inward. It is within us. Later, John will call it in 1 John, the anointing that you have received from him, which in a sense impresses on your heart the truth of Christ so that you hear the voice of Christ. My sheep hear my voice. It's kind of a subjective element, but it needs to be tied to objective truth. There's a balance here. We are not just subjectivists. We're not mystics. We have an objective frame of reference in which our subjectivity is going to have this Christian experience. And of course, it seems that that's what's being highlighted, spirit and truth. And uh, that, of course, is the kind that John says, or Jesus says, God is seeking. Seeking sovereignly. Like my friend Ichabod Cain gave me the pen, it found me. That's how God seeks us. He seeks us sovereignly, you know. Well, God is spirit. Those who worship must worship in spirit and truth. There's no indefinite article here, nor should there be. God is spirit qualitatively the same way that God is light, God is love. These are qualitative descriptions. God is spirit. He's not physical. He's not uh, in, in his in his essence as deity, he is not something that can be seen. So we worship him in spirit and in truth. The woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming, who is called Christ. When he comes, he'll proclaim all things to us. Jesus said to her, I who am speaking to you am he. She says, I know rather than we know. She's already acknowledged she's a prophet. Now she says, we know that Messiah is coming, and then it says, when he, but the word there is a kenos, it means when that one comes, and it'll be a way of referring to something um, unique, only one, when that one comes, you see, he is going to give us, I call this last week, the whole enchilada, you see. We know that the Messiah is coming. One unique expression of God's presence among us is on his way, and we know that when that one comes, all the fog is going to be cleared away, and we are going to get the whole truth of heaven through him. That was her understanding. She is looking forward to such a person. John gives us the translation for his Greek readers, the Christos, which is the same as the word Messiah, anointed one, the christened one. And of course, in this remarkable affirmation, I am, ego a me. The one speaking to you uh, happens to be that very one. This is the first of the several I am statements in the Gospel of John, which are commonly taken to be a reference and affirmation of Christ's own deity. He didn't say that to Nicodemus. <clears throat> he rarely says it. In fact, he avoids uh, this, for the most part, because of its political uh, you know, sort of implications. But here with this woman, this Samaritan woman, unnamed, a woman at the well, came come to draw water. He says to her expressly, ego eimi, I am he. Conclude with this, uh, this uh, it comes from a fourth century uh, Christian leader named Ephraim the Syrian. And he's commenting on this story. I just love this. I thought you might appreciate it. Uh, he says, quote, First, she caught sight of a thirsty man, then a Jew, then a rabbi, afterwards a prophet, last of all the Messiah. She tried to get the better of the thirsty man. She showed her dislike of the Jew. She heckled the rabbi. She was swept off her feet by the prophet, and she adored the Christ. You know, kind of the uh, chain of events that uh, lead her from just a woman coming to a well uh, to a worshiper of Christ. Next time we're together, six weeks hence, we're going to see what kind of missionary she became. because She goes to her city, and a little while later, the whole town is coming out as a result of her proclamation. So uh, that well of water got to work right away, and she had quite an impact right off the bat. All right, I'll wrap this up rapidly. Number one. 
We should enter every day knowing that the most ordinary circumstances may become the most life-changing. I don't know how many times that woman had gone out to get water out of that well. Can you imagine? Every day, every day, trudging out to get water out of a well. How did she know that this was going to be the day that would not only transfer her life, transform her eternity? How did she know? I love my schedule. I'm 73. That's old, you know? Something I've learned about being old is I like every day to be just exactly like every other day. I like an uninterrupted schedule. And to interrupt that schedule upsets me. I'm just confessing to you. But you realize that as much as we may be tied to the schedule of going out every day to get water out of a well, you never know which day might be the day that God is going to meet you in a way that just staggers and boggles your imagination. So always be uh, waiting for it. Always be looking for it, even in the the repetition of life. Uh, Never doubt that God may show up, you know, at some unexpected moment. We should view every desire we have as a work of God intended to bring us more deeply to Christ. We should not be ashamed of our desires. It's good to desire, but as I've said before, we should always see the face of Christ as the ultimate satisfaction of every desire we have. Any amount of money in the bank, uh, any amount of achievement in your profession, any of those things can bring satisfaction, and rightly so, it's fine, you know, it's okay. But isn't it true that the satisfaction we have in Christ infinitely exceeds anything, the tinsel that could be offered by this world? Every true Christian believes that, Sometimes we had to be tested on a little bit, but certainly the truth of it is undeniable. Finally, we should regard each person we meet as one who can drink the living water Christ has planted in our souls. Paul writes to the Ephesians, don't let any destructive communication proceed out of your mouth. Every conversation, don't let any destructive Communication proceed out of your mouth, but only such as is good for building up so that you can minister grace to the hearer. You are a means of grace. You're a mean, in some ways, small s, you're kind of like a sacrament. Every person you meet is an opportunity to minister grace and build up out of a well of water that's springing up in you to everlasting life. We have a great treasure in an earthen vessel, and we should share that treasure just as widely as we possibly can and as joyfully as we can muster, because that's what God has called us to do. And that's what this woman did, and she's a great example for us as well. Amen. All right, well, I've kept you right up to the edge here, but um, I'd really love to hear from you. If you have a thought, question, feedback, clarification, Angela. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, there's a division of opinion on that. So it could have been noon, which probably would have been worse, you know. Um, I did read one commentator who said she was probably drawing water at that particular time to avoid public scrutiny. Uh, She has a dubious reputation and that uh, she doesn't want to go to the well in the early morning, which would be the normal time when it's kind of cool and all the others are there and they can kind of you know share whatever the news is of the day but she's going at a less opportune time 6 p.m maybe even more less opportune than even noon would be i I, that's probably what you're getting at and and uh yeah that has been commented on um so good good thought any follow-up on that or is it yeah yeah i think so i think so yes that's, uh, that's an extreme, and so Angela's point here is that uh, she's behaving by all external measures like a social outcast, and I think that's probably true, which makes the next part of the story more amazing because she's going to go right back into town and become an evangelist <laughs> to all of these people who have been treating her like an outcast, you know, 
but all of a sudden this well of water in her is going to overrule all of those concerns and they will in fact respond uh, in a big way to that. So that's, uh, that really does come out you know, in the next part, but thank you, that's, that's great. Thanks for reminding us of that. Anybody else? Says this to okay, Virginia. Is he the first? Is is this the first person to whom he affirms that he is the Messiah? Uh, it could be because if you read the synoptics, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, all three of them concur that the first time there's a clear affirmation of Christ as the Messiah is at Caesarea Philippi. When Jesus says, who do you say that I am? Peter says, you're the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus says, blessed are you, Simon. This presumably happened well before, you know, Caesarea Philippi. And so, at least by, the, by taking this story in terms of what the synoptics tell us, yeah, I think that's safe to say that Jesus in this fairly private conversation affirms to her what is not really uh, affirmed at any other time until much later. There's certainly evidence of, of um, speculation and suspicion that Jesus is the Christ, but when you ask when does he actually affirm it, it would be Caesarea Philippi, except for this. So that's a, that's a good, good thought. First of all, she is a woman. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's surprising. Yeah, it is. And it just leads me to remark again how often uh, the gospel writers uh, make sure we don't miss that point. The first person who saw the resurrected Christ was who? Who was the first person? Mary Magdalene, another woman of dubious reputation, you know. And so we, we find that there's something in the work of God which is kind of revising, even in the first century, when you would have hardly thought it could happen, uh, you know, kind of rehabilitating our whole view of the human race and especially of women and their importance and their role. So it's a, it's a, that's a great point, you know, that this is really, he's affirming it for the first time to this uh, Samaritan woman. It's good. Yes, Angela. Okay, yeah, good. That's a great, great question, and it's one probably I should have addressed, you know, off the bat, but um, ego, a me, are the two words. Ego, we get ego from that, and a me means I am. So it's emphatic, I am is the sense of it. The Old Testament was originally in Hebrew, but it was translated into, into Greek in a translation called the Septuagint you know, that was about 250 B.C. or thereabouts. Under the orders of uh, kind of the uh, original impulse for that was Alexander the Great, surprisingly enough, although he was dead by then. Um, and uh, so you have uh, the Septuagint, which in a Greek-speaking world had become the standard authorized version of the Old Testament. Most Jewish people read the Old Testament in the Septuagint, including in Palestine. You see, Greek was, it was, it was a widely accepted, taken as authoritative. In the Septuagint of the Old Testament, I'm gonna deal with this, there's another lecture coming up eventually where we'll actually look at this in greater detail, but for the, most, for, for the time being, in the Old Testament, the name Yahweh, I am, is invariably translated that way, or it's stated that way, ego eimi. Sometimes in a dramatic sort of way, there's some really wonderful examples of that that we'll take a brief look at at another time. So when Jesus comes on the scene, especially in John's gospel, and at very strategic moments says, ego a me, and in here, that's all he says, ego a me, I am. To anybody familiar with the Old Testament, it would be hard not to take that as an affirmation of deity. It's an affirmation of Yahweh, you know which is the name for God, and roughly means I am, or that I, I am, that I am, or something like that, but the I am is at the heart of it. So yeah, that's, that's a good question, and I think that's the right take on it. Yeah, yeah. We'll never know. Uh, yeah, yeah, well, that's a good question. Philip's question is, Jesus has such reticence 
to have this uh, I am the Christ identity, you know, getting out into the public square. Uh, and yet here, uh, he affirms it, you know, fairly early in the story to this woman. And was it just that this is an insular community and the message will never get out uh, or at least won't spread as much? Maybe there's something to that. Um, I, 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 my, I think there's, uh, there's layers to this, and I'm kind of shooting from the hip here a little bit. I think the fact that he's in Samaria, uh, it may not be so much that he doesn't want the message to get out, but that he does want the message to get out that he's the Messiah for people that are not Jewish. Uh, I would take that at least as part of it. Also, the term Messiah had a much less political charge connected to it in Samaria or in Phoenicia or in Decapolis or other Gentile regions he visited because they didn't see Messiah in the kind of uh, political tones, terms, that, that people living in Jerusalem did, who saw this as a guy coming in on a white horse who was gonna call down fire from heaven and run the Romans out of town and do the, the kind of a revolutionary character. And I think when Jesus is so reticent to let himself be identified that way among Jewish people, it's partly just the practical concern of not kind of inciting a riot that was nothing he wanted to have anything to do with at this point, you know. So here it's a little safer ground with the Samaritans. Uh, there may be more to it than that, but I think some of that probably is, is in there as well. Thank you all. Let's, uh, let's close in prayer and I'll let you go. Our Father, we are so grateful for a conversation that took place 2,000 years ago in which a woman had her life transformed so profoundly that 2,000 years later we're still standing here in wonder at what you did. We're grateful for it. We thank you that that is really the story of your work through human history, taking sometimes unlikely people and turning their lives around, so much so that any onlooker would be stunned to think God must be in heaven to do such a thing. We believe it, we love you for it, we're grateful that you have done something like that in our lives, and we rejoice in it, and thank you for it in the name of Jesus, amen.